Hello, may I take down your number, please? 528321. Good morning. Can I help you, sir? We want to go to Horton Plains. Can you make some arrangements? Yes, we can. When do you hope to go there, sir? Let's say tomorrow in the morning. At what time? Say about 8 o'clock. How many of you be going there? All together five, including two children. We can arrange that, sir. Thank you. legend, the valleys and the plateaus bounded by Pidurutalagala in the west, Hakgala in the north, Galagamakanda below Horton Plains in the east, and Adams Peak in the south, were known as the Nandana Uddhyanya, the pleasure gardens of Ravana, the king of Lanka. Located at over 6,000 feet above sea level, this area has a number of plateaus, including the Moon Plains and the Sita Elia Plains around Nurelia, the Elk Plains above them, and the highest of them all, the Horton Plains. Legend has it that these plains were created by Hanuman, the monkey god, to whom Rama, the hero of the Indian epic, the Ramayana, had turned for help. In his efforts to help Rama free his wife Sita, held in captivity in these mountain fastnesses by Ravana, Hanuman had set fire to the forests, turning them to grassland. The clefts and the streams are said to be the furrows of Rama's arrows. Sinhalese from ancient times as Maha Elia or the Great Plains, the Horton Plains at over 7,200 feet above sea level are the highest tableland in Sri Lanka. The words of Samuel Baker, an Englishman who hunted elk and elephant in this area 150 years ago. There is a peculiar freedom in the Horton Plains, an absence from everywhere a wildness in the thought that there is not a tame animal within many miles, not a village, nor hut, nor human being, no boundaries but mountain tops and the horizon, no paths but those trodden by the elk and elephant. Here there is a sense of being on top of everything, There are man-made roads today, which from time to time enlightened government agents, wildlife enthusiasts and conservationists have attempted to close or to leave in a state of disrepair to discourage frequent traffic. Less than a hundred years ago, in his manual of the Nuralia district, the British civil servant Le Measurer reported that 
all the country now comprising the planting district, which had been one unbroken stretch of magnificent forest land, is now a vast field of tea, coffee and cinchona. As you approach Horton Plains through any of the four routes which have now replaced the paths trodden by the elephant and the elk, you can see the new uses to which this land has been put, sometimes with disastrous effect. The road from Agrapatana and Diagama climbs through tea plantations and the exotic pasture lands of Bopatalava, which support herds of a rare breed of cattle. The country through which one drives from Nanuaya through Ambevale is similar, but as on the road from Ohia to Horton Plains, the stretch between Ambevale, Patipola and Horton Plains was planted with eucalyptus, cypress, and pinus to feed steam engines and tea factories and in more recent years for railway sleepers, telegraph posts and wood pulp. One can reach Ohia by train or by road from Ballymada. A more interesting route to Ohia takes the intrepid motorist up the Devil's Staircase from the Udaveri estate. From Ohia the road ascends a thousand feet through hillsides covered with wild violets, forget-me-nots and raspberry. As one emerges at the top of the climb from Ohia to Horton Plains, the road passes through a grove of Kina. With its canopy flattened by the strong winds that buffet this region, the Kina stands as a symbol of survival on Horton Plains. Its gnarled and twisted branches bearded with moss. undergo seasonal changes more extensive than in other parts of the country. From the clear sky and warm days of February and April to the wet and windy months of August and October and the cold days of December to January when the plains are covered by hoarfrost which yields a sizable snowball for homesick visitors from snowbound lands. Visitors are able to pick the time of their choosing, but for the game ranger and his assistants and the bungalow keepers, the Horton Plains are their life.
in season and out. Regular contact with the outside world is on weekends and public holidays when a bus lumbers up from Ohia. The most difficult and the most inviting route to the plains is on foot through Belihuloya. This bridal path was opened by the Singhala chief Mahavalatenne, the first Adiga in 1835, to enable the colonial governor to climb down from Norelia to visit him. An ascent of 5,000 feet takes one through hillsides since planted up in tea along the Belihuloya which rising in Totopolakanda plunges through the tangled breaks and murky forests of the mountain walls of Ravana's garden. On this stream are several pools and waterfalls named by or after Englishmen in colonial times. Among them the native name is retained by the Galagama Falls, where the stream plunges to a beautiful tract of paddy fields. Above it are the Baker's Falls, the Gem Pit Falls, where Thomas Farr once spotted an otter flashing through the shallows, and the Slab Rock Falls, divided transversely into two, where the Samba often made his final stand against the retriever, the pointer, the hound and the hunter's knife in years gone by. is also studded with pools, such as the Diamond Pool and the Governor's Pool, which British planters stocked with brown and rainbow trout a hundred years ago. Fishing continues in season by license from the Director of Wildlife Conservation. hunting cottage named after Thomas Farr continues to provide lodging for the overnight visitor. Although it now has a generator, it still uses a firewood stove and a coal stove. visitor can enjoy the luxury of a glass of brandy or a cup of tea beside an open hearth. Two miles away is the Anderson Lodge, built by a British planter up in Horton Plains, although the bulk of his estate lay some 2,000 feet below. This is a convenient location for observing the bear monkey, which Major Forbes observed as a species of a very large monkey of a dark color, which when resting on all four feet, looked like a Ceylon bear. A 
shy creature, the bear monkey is wary of photographers. Hard by this lodge are the headwaters of a river which cascades down the Bambarakanda Falls 30 miles away at the highest waterfall in Sri Lanka. Totopolakanda, the third highest mountain in the country, lies off the road from Patipola and provides a convenient hike. A strenuous hike of some seven miles from Farin takes one up Kirigalpotta, the second highest mountain in Sri Lanka. Here one walks up through the elfin forest and on it rests the tombstone of an Englishman who desired to be buried there. The Bhogavantalava oil which flows into the Kalaniganga and the Agra oil, which flows into the Mahavali Ganga, originate on this mountain. For the casual visitor, a walk towards world's end is a must. It's a short walk, but takes you through a jungle which attacks your senses with its myriad hues of green the occasional head of scarlet bloom of the rhododendron, while the Nelu plant is everywhere. From where the land falls 5,000 feet in a sheer precipice, day you can see the Hambegamu reservoir to the east and far away to the southwest the reservoirs of Udavalave and Chandrika Veva, beyond which lies the Indian Ocean off the coast of Ambalantota. The Nilu flower smells of honey and attracts swarms of bees and once it flowers it dies and gives birth to a new plant in its place. flowers but once in its eighth, tenth or twelfth year. Nearby, the trees are covered by the lichen known as Old Man's Beard. The plains are covered by varieties of grass, of which the dominant species is endemic to these plains. The grasslands are dotted with the leathery leaves and the bright red of the asoka flower. and the flower of the Naga Meru Ali, which is said to have aphrodisiac properties. The green and gold of the dwarf bamboo points out the streams which wind through these plains. vast jungle solitudes, on every twig, round every tree, the stilly damp of ages has twined a mossy vesture. 
from its slender filaments on the young shoots. Slight texture on the smaller branches and heavy folds enveloping the parent stem of forest patriarchs, we learn how time, undisturbed by tempest, has woven the solemn drapery of this silent region. Here you might see in season the stag getting ready to shed their velvet. The bright green edges of the grass in the plains show recent and continuous grazing by the samba. By the edge of the forest, the leopard awaits its prey. You might come upon coveys of jungle fowl, Snipe, and if you are lucky, the hawk eagle, now greatly diminished in numbers. These open patches in the jungle were used as a midday bivouac by the herds of elephant who roamed these plains up to 50 years ago. Extensively slaughtered by British sportsmen, the elephant still exists, not too far away in the wilderness of Adams Peak. As recently as 30 years ago, it was hoped that they would go back to Horton Plains and re-establish their presence there. It is still possible that this will come to pass. For the young and the young at heart, Hiking in Horton Plains provides a unique experience and only those handicapped by a vile liver or a guilty conscience would fail to enjoy its delights. Until the advent of the colonial enterprise, this region was maintained by the Sinhalese kings as what we would call today a strict natural reserve. The Sinhalese who lived in the valleys below respected it as a tahanankale, or a reserved forest. A hundred and fifty years ago, there remained only the faint traces here of the temporary residence of fugitive princes. Queen Dona Caterina retreated for a short period to Norelia in 1635. But the forest was not cleared, and its riches were enjoyed via the clear streams that were used for irrigation a hundred miles away.
Today we see these rivers after they have traversed the vast areas cleared for the cultivation of tea, brick red with the topsoil, making their sluggish way down to choke the reservoir and silt up the paddy fields on their passage down to the sea. up in Horton Plains, the jungle is still undisturbed. The grassland provides pasture for the samba and rootings for the wild boar. The old man's beard spreads its tentacles and the streams run clear. And that is why for us in Sri Lanka, where the world ends is where our life begins. <laughs> 